What's up, guys? Welcome to the Neo Vintage Podcast. I'm Jabrell, and I'm here with... Steve, how's everyone doing today? And thank you for listening to our podcast. We are just two guys that like to talk over gaming and the biggest stories happening in gaming. So, let's start with the first segment, which is what we're playing. I've been playing a number of different things. I'm kind of all over the place. I finally finished Pokemon, so I got that out of the way. That's done. More time... I, it, like, didn't end when I thought it was going to end. So I don't know what that was about. This Sword and Shield guys you mentioned? Yeah. No spoilers. <laughs> That those guys, I was like, I don't know what that's about. I've been recently playing Star Wars Battlefront, the original one, on the original Xbox because they just released it for free on uh, Games with Gold. Yeah. So I've been playing that a lot, loving that. So it holds up surprisingly well, mm-hmm. considering how old it is. Uh, I've been playing that, finishing up Coffee Talk for sure, and then I've been playing a game called I think Bleeding Edge. Have you heard about this? The beta that they just released on on Game Pass. The hero fighter yeah basically yeah so it's like a little bit of overwatch a lot of league and not my kind of game (laughs) but i did want to give it a shot and they they really got something going on there but for the most part i've been balancing those those games how about you uh so i'm taking a break as i do most usually anytime i'm playing a jrpg so um the persona fire emblem tokyo mirage i don't know why yeah tokyo mirage it's eventually i always get to a point where it's just so much repetitiveness that i just take a how break. long do you think you're in back and forth? i think i'm like 20 something hours oh, so you're in. pretty deep in. yeah but i usually do take my time doing the side missions because it helps level up so i'm taking a break actually and i've been playing three games i've been dabbling in media molecules dreams that just went into full release street fighter 5 that is has their new champion oh yeah i heard edition, they added so, a whole bunch of new stuff yeah i had that so i've been back in street fighter 5 and then just a little bit of a uh, fire um Fire Emblem Warriors, the Muso. Yeah. Which I've had for a while. Played it when it first came out and then just stopped. How are you liking that? It's fun. It's, it's fun. It's more of a mindless just kind of hack and slash, you know, as you do in these kind of games. And I've been having fun with it. It's, it is what it is. I like those characters a yeah. lot. So Does um, it have characters from Three Houses in it? Or is it all the games previous? So I know there's some DLC and I have not looked at the DLC pack. I think it's. It, I think it was like almost two years between yeah. these games. So I'm not sure if they have any of the Three Houses characters in base game i know they don't so but that's all i've been really kind of been playing actually just a little bit of those three all right cool so uh as we introduced last week we do a small game shout out for games that you may not or may know of so this week we want to talk about twin breaker a sacred symbols adventure which is obviously the game that from colin moriarty and chris Raygun's podcast sacred symbols they have been co- you know collaborating with little Mo games which is one man studio Barry Johnson comes out March twenty fourth, ten dollars cross buy for PS four and Vita, two separate trophy lists, and it's basic basically a brick breaker game with a story mode. But I mean, weird. It, it's a weird choice. I would yeah. have never guessed that. But for ten bucks cross buy and giving the Vita some deal. love, that's that's a great deal. Whether or not you want to support them or not, so yeah, no, I'm ex- look, I'm excited. For it looks it looks fun. Yeah, it's definitely mean, fun. Coming out way sooner than I thought. They really held it close because he's like, you know, we're holding off to release anything, any information on it, and then I didn't expect it to be like a month off. And for ten dollars, cross by with a pretty elaborately written story from the small amount uh, Colin has been talking about it. I'm really, really excited. About yeah, it. I'm going in just thinking it'll have a lot of fun references, a lot of jokes, and give some essence to. I mean, I like playing Brick Breakers in general. Yeah, I, I you know, it's been a while, so this kind of just collided perfectly for me. And, I mean, we've been waiting for whatever this is and incubating for quite a while. Big fan of that podcast. And so, yeah, of course, we'll, we'll nothing, see. Nothing but love for those guys. All right. So, first story on the list, and I kind of mentioned already, Dreams is finally out. Finally. Media Molecule's Dreams, which was announced in 2013. If I remember correctly, it was announced alongside the PlayStation 4 conference. Yeah, like six years ago. The reveal. Like no, it's 2013. Oh, 2013 even. Oh, it's Jeez. When the PS4 was announced, has it really been that long? When the PS4 was announced, oh, wow. they also, pre, I'm pre, almost 100 percent sure they announced Dreams. Media Molecule, I believe, was there at that conference. Uh, I didn't realize it's been and that it's long. And it's been that long. And then it was radio silence for so long. They delayed the demo slash beta for so long for two years from the date, and it finally went to early access last year. And I took advantage and jumped in at the early access price. Then you got the free upgrade to the full version. And while it was in Early access. I remember we, we played a little bit of it in the beta yep. form, which again was just kind of the creation tool and 
the I like I don't like to say marketplace, but the share space, I guess. If you played Little Big Planet, you can get a light idea of what they're kind yeah, of going you, for there. You can play for yeah, the whole create play share aspect's really been pushed off. So finally playing a little bit more of it in its full fledged version. It's a great game creation engine. I've seen some people create some crazy good things and I've seen people who actually just like actually sculpting make you know crazy I mean everyone's seen the breakfast and that breakfast uh splatter oh, the like, that, that hyper realistic yeah. there's tons of that looks now. crazy too yeah that pretty impressive crazy tech. there's one where there's like fries burgers you saw like the grease coming off it and it's an interesting tool some of the g- games i've seen it is what it is it's still kind of choppy because most people are just getting access to it my only issue is that they kept promising there was gonna be a single player component very much like i believe like little big planet has the campaign and little big planet 2 has a campaign a really good one too yeah enjoyable ones this one doesn't have a campaign in the normal sense as when you go into the dream surfing which is the creation you know the creation market they have theirs there really displayed and it's fine it is just kind of more of a showcase of like here's a kind of a click and you know point and click style here's a top-down shooter style here's some light 3d platforming and it makes me wish they made a game and i know they did um what was that paper one Terrafold, Terra. There was yeah, a Vita game, and yeah, it was moved on yeah, yeah. to the PlayStation Four. Terraway, Terraway, yeah, yeah. maybe I don't know. And I know they did that while also doing this, but I just feel like they should be, like the snippets they give you make me feel like those were blown into bigger games instead of like these awkwardly stitched together. And the story is like boring. It's like if I explain it to you, it would sound more fun than it is. You go through this okay. guy who left the band's dreams. And you play like these little mini adventures, which is him kind of colliding with himself and come to the realization, you know, he needs friends and stuff like that. And it's cheesy and it's fine, but it's just awkwardly put together. And it's they're really just to showcase the, the engine. Yeah, so it's more of a, like a tech demo and a proof of concept than it is actual game at this point. And do you know how much it's retailing for right now? Is it 40? I, I don't. I believe it's 40. I know they actually did physicals, which I didn't under. I didn't know it was physical because I if you joined, if you bought it digitally, the beta want to say last year you got the free upgrade i want to say it's retailing for 40 anything more than that that is ps4 only right there's not on pc in any capacity not right now so it's got this weird like mobile website where you can look at different tools they keep they're really weird with their phrasing where they're saying phase one is all about ps4 and creation phase two is about exporting this is also you know you gotta remember these guys were hiring for people to make games in their game to potentially sell so again, this is more like an engine. I'm not sure even why they went this far with it. The UI really just begs for a mouse and keyboard. And when you're going into creation tools, you want to be so specific. It's hard to do with a controller. Yeah, it's not a. It's because then you gotta use the the, the motion on like oh, DualShock. Really? Or I don't know if the update's out yet where you can use the move controls and it's like awkward. I know they want to do VR stuff. So obviously the next step would probably be a B somehow the PS5. Which you gotta assume backwards compatible, so you shouldn't have to relaunch it. I assume this has to come to PC if you really it has want. To. I think that's where it's gonna ultimately find its legs in any capacity with mm. developers on PC. I don't see this really gaining any traction on PS4. Not to mention the game sphere is not really where it was when Media Miracle was dropping stuff like Little Big Planet. It's moved far away. This needs to be in developers' hands for the most part, and I just don't see it getting any like retail love on a commercial basis from the average consumer i don't see what the appeal is to this i mean i've seen some really cool like d makes like ps1 versions through that which is cool and all but i just don't see anybody sinking you know 30 40 hours into ps1 d makes on playstation (laughs) like i just don't really get who this is for other than developers and again if this is more of an engine tool then why wouldn't it launch like something like a unity engine straight onto steam or something like that and i understand that medium molecule is a like a playstation first team but i just don't really get what the commercial viability for this is and what their long-term vision for it is Mm -hmm. and the economic realities not to mention they're close to a new console launch i just unless they do a big expansion too when ps5 comes because you know launch games sell maybe they can find a way to get that casual consumer to adopt it and maybe have some stuff there for them, but I don't really see it happening. Yeah, they've gone on record saying they have a 10-year plan. If this game would have came out way closer to the PS4 launch and then was, like, surviving 
and had this great history of being alongside the PlayStation 4, I think we'd be a different story. But you're at the end of the end of the generation cycle. For the first like five years, nobody understood what Dreams was. We knew it was Media Molecule's new game, and we knew, it, of course, it had some sort of create, play, share, because that's their tagline. But you're waiting till the end. You're waiting till everyone's hopped up, ready to go play Resident Evil Three Remake, Last of Us, Ghost of yeah, Tsushima, all, the big hitters, all yeah. these big hitters. You've kind of been sleeping for a while. I understand this game took a long time to make because of what it is. But can you blame them? Can you blame the consumer not to want to buy because they don't want to make their game? They want to play one, and I know some people do want to make it. But that's why, like like you said, it will probably live so much better on a Steam, or they should have released the tools separate or for a whole lot less. I'm just concerned about Media Molecule because as time has progressed, you've seen Sony and specifically the PlayStation subsect of Sony becoming way more no nonsense with these teams, and they want to see returns when they ask to see those returns, and they don't really have a problem closing these teams. And I just worry with the really low output and the fact that I don't see this really gaining traction in the next few years. I think over time, this could be something. Who knows? We'll have... The, a lot of games coming off, and you see the dream splash screen at the the front of their games, and that could be really financially beneficial to PlayStation and Media Molecule. But I don't see that popping up for the next two to three years while these games are in incubation and being created. What like does PlayStation just allow them to continue having nothing out? It took them what all these years mm-hmm. to create this engine that it's going to take another few years to see the results of. Are they just going to? keep them open and dumping money into this when you see that they need to focus on putting their money into hardware and all the economic realities of a new console launches. And we'll get into that later, what mm-hmm. the financial aspect of that looks. I just don't see a scenario where they just allow them to do anything like this again, if they re- remain a PlayStation team or if they remain open, period. Yeah, I feel like I feel like in, they probably will go second. Part. Like if Sony were to... Be like, all right, we're done with Media Molecule. I hope they don't just close the team because yeah, it is a talented so. team. They probably do better kind of being more like third party, second party, whatever they want to do. RT indie team too, if anything. Yeah. But but Sony also is very brutal. I mean, they just closed that other team that never released a game. They, they, they created oh, yeah, the VR team. The, yeah. They created a team for VR for five years. They never released a game. Manchester team, I think. That I believe is Sony Manchester. Yeah. And they closed that team. <laughs> that team never put a game yeah. out. That's what I'm telling you. So they have a low tolerance for nonsense. So you gave days. Media Molecule, you got to assume like 10 years to create this. What are you going to get in return, especially when you sell it at such a low price? That's why people are people are optimistic. It's getting great reviews, but people are kind of not looking forward. Like It's fun now when you can play a janky version of Crash Bandicoot. That's cool. But eventually that's not going to be on the market due to copyrights, especially when they're going to start charging or they want people to start selling their in-game made game. Yeah. Then I gonna, imagine Media Molecule takes some kind of split. Who yeah. takes the split? Sony was gonna want to cut. You know, is gonna want to cut. The the creator is gonna want to make some money on it too, instead of just getting his name out there. It's they're just in a weird spot, and I don't. Again, like you said, I don't know who the audience was. I don't know who did the research that this is where Media Molecule should have put. You know all their eggs into this basket i think in the reality is it took so long that it almost shifted into a new age unknowingly mm-hmm. i mean in 2013 a game like this kind of made sense fresh off little big planet even though they didn't make the third one the creation games you know you've seen games like uh terraria pop up you've seen games like minecraft back then and then fast forward 10 years and now it seems out of place but i think that's just kind of the ramifications of having a really really long dev cycle and i guess ultimately the make or break moment was how much did this cost Sony and how long before they make that money back, let alone become profitable? And that's ultimately something only the shareholders know. But mm-hmm. I think that's ultimately going to make or break whether this continues to be a Sony team is, yeah, how much money did PlayStation really sink into this? And when will they actually see that back? Because if it looks like, oh, we're not going to be able to be profitable, at least make our money back and get out of the red until 2023. There's no way in hell they see another cent from Sony. Not not in this day and age, and not with in the beginning of a new new cycle console cycle. No, yeah. When you when you gotta talk, margins are gonna be thin. It's all about that bottom dollar. And again, I'm not trying to be negative. I, I would love for Media Molecule. I, like my, Media I want Molecule. Dreams to go. F- I believed in them. That's why I bought it in the beta version when there was not too much to offer there. And I believe them. I believe in them. I also would like their next step to be make a game. Show us you know that you also can do that instead of just creating an engine. I know creating an engine's hard, but if you're 
game developer make me a game yeah not don't make me make myself a game because that's not what i want to do so but i mean the best of luck to them i hope this is profitable i know it's getting crazy good reviews i just i hope it has the legs to stand and hopefully everything works out well for them and this is like some crazy big indie hit well i think ultimately we're gonna get our answers as to how this plays out relatively soon because now the game is fully launched the eyes on them and sony's if they're going to make a decision, they're going to make it soon because they're not going to go into the PS... Once the PS5 launches, they don't got time to focus on that kind of petty stuff. So if they're going to keep them around, we're going to know relatively soon yes. or not. All right, so our second story is basically Anthem being reworked in some capacity. So this is a statement we got from BioWare. They said, over the, fo- uh, the coming months, we will be focusing on a longer-term redesign of the experience specifically working to reinvent the core gameplay loop with clear goals, motivating challenges and progression with meaningful rewards while preserving the fun and flying and fighting in a vast science fantasy setting. A whole lot of nothing, but... (laughs) And to do that properly, we'll be doing something we'd like to have done more the first time around, giving a focused team the time to test and iterate. So this basically kind of indirectly confirms what everyone has been saying for the past, I don't know how long it's been since this game was first shown off, EA did not give them the time nor the resources to get this out in a full finished capacity. And now after it's flopped and no one cares about it, now it's like, okay, yeah, maybe you should finish the game now. So all that rushing for ultimately nothing. What do you think about it? This is, I don't know if this is just PR talk or they actually have hope for Anthem. I think everyone, and everyone expected this when Anthem came out and was universally just disappointed was, oh, they'll do, like, Destiny, and Destiny did the Forsaken King. The Taken King, yeah. The Taken King, sorry, yeah, the Taken King DLC, and revamped it, and everything will be okay. I don't think you guys understand that, though that was kind of upper from Activision, you also had Bungie that had a good relationship with its consumer base. EA is (laughs) straight, just they want money. I know they've made some good choices, but usually those choices aren't them, like, you know, Jedi Fallen Order wasn't that wasn't ea's call that had to be way up in that was respawn and disney and all these people who had in charge of that it's crazy to think that they think anthem can just be revamped and good to go now let's say they do add you know npcs a better hub world a better story a story because there is no story another map because everything takes place on the same map and i know it's you know chopped together and they eliminate the millions of loading screens you're talking about a whole nother game. Most people are over this game. The game is dead. If not, they also bought this game for like $5 yeah, over like the me. holidays me. like you. <laughs> I mean, I was, I was working at GameStop when this game launched. And the amount of people who brought it back the next day, it was just insane. And I don't know how that works when people refund it. Is it GameStop that loses? Is it EA? Is it Bioware? All I know is this: this is like a dead horse. They keep on beating and they're trying to resurrect it. You're, I just don't think this game is at a point where you can fix it. And when you do, are you going to launch it like a $45 expansion and tell people they have to pay for that? And I understand most people paid very cheap for Anthem. There are some people who paid that $60. The there was an $80 version that brought you another, <laughs> uh, I think, helmet or like weird like graphic you can put on a scarf. You're telling people who paid $80, believed in you then, now have to pay another $45 to get the complete experience that you guys messed up on. I understand there's a big thing. I remember the the article from Drace, I think it was in Kotaku, Jason Schreider, yep. with development where they weren't even allowed to talk about Destiny, talk about other MMOs, keep their heads down, not to mention their <laughs> Mass Effect, which was, you know, you think they do try to evolve on that? You They weren't allowed to talk about this. So for them to make this game with their heads down, make a basic formula and then expect people to be like well in two years you guys can play the full fledge you know it's like um it's like the fallout 76 situation oh it's not where you start it's where you end up no you may pay money that's people, fine people, when it's free to play but when, yeah, people when it's put a money... free to play or it's an early access or it's a beta you know what you're getting into when you're telling me full fledged here's the game it's been delayed forever you keep seeing it here's this fake e3 and fake trailer demo with people's talking over their headset and 
I remember there's one funny one where this like there's this gun where they find where these this guy and this girl were talking on the gameplay. That gun doesn't exist in the game. Oh, that I, fake vertical the fake, vertical slice. Yeah, thing, that but, vertical slice. Yeah, I remember where that. The hub world was all these people interacting. The graphics was downgraded and everything like that. But there's they showed like things you can do in that that you could not do in the actual game, and it's just it's insane to see. I mean, I jumped into the game well after everybody else about a couple months ago. Got it for literally five bucks. And after playing it for maybe an hour and a half or so, I, I was just sitting there kind of like, what is the point of this? Like, this does nothing I haven't seen done better by other games. Again, Destiny, there's a, a lot of persistent online games that do what it does way better than it does. There's nothing that creative about it. The story is a whole bunch of nonsense, which, again, yeah, Destiny Stories was some nonsense too. But they had an amazing gameplay loop that they were able to develop over time. And I just don't get the point of Anthem and why they're doubling down either they spent an astronomical amount of money on it and the shareholders are like you better fix this after putting all that money in there that's the only reality I could think of and maybe they fix this over a game like Mass Effect Andromeda because maybe because that's a single player game sold what it sold but if they're able to fix a persistent online game there's a possibility that they can make up some lost finances and time with microtransactions perhaps mm -hmm. there is kind of a economic reality that they can kind of play around with and a malleability to a persistent online game that may not be the way like for example if like fallen order flopped they may not have put a ton of money into it because again it's a single player experience that the money the only money you're going to make off it is maybe a little bit of dlc money and whatever the people bought the full price game for if they bought it used you ain't seeing none of that but with a game like anthem it's in a lot of people's hands because it sold really well and maybe if they fix it, they're hoping for, I swear, Destiny is kind of like the best and worst thing ever because it's the best thing that Bungie was able to get something happening there. But it's the worst thing because it has all these terrible flop games thinking that they can fix themselves. Because if it wasn't for Destiny coming out the way it came out and then them able to make something of it, all these people would move on and actually make a finished game. But now that whole like release now, fix later thing happened because of destiny and it worked out for destiny and i just don't see it happening well for anthem at all yeah people i mean you have to you also have to remember that it worked out for destiny one it did not work out for destiny true two. for destiny two they do try to do the exact same thing release a base game with a you know season pass and nobody bought the season pass they did a second expansion which i think that's the forsaken and nobody bought that then you had to do this you know they had to go free to play and I know no developer wants to put their game out for free. You want people to buy your game and feel proud you bought it. You're telling me you they, they flopped on the main game. They flopped on the first season pass. They flopped on their revamp because everyone thought the Forsaken was going to do what the Taken King did. That didn't do it. So you have to make it free to play. I mean, I understand there was this whole battle and they luckily took it away from Activision. And it's all them now. But now they're free to play. It has tons of microtransactions in it. The cosmetic system is all messed up because you now you have limited time use of your colors, pretty much of your shaders they call them. So even though it did work out for Destiny One, the same story didn't happen with Destiny Two. People forget that there was two big expansions and nobody cared. Nobody played them. I mean, a year after it came out, it was free on PlayStation Plus. It was a PS Plus game, hoping people would buy into the Forsaken. People did. I know people did do a little bit. And everyone's talking about how it's so revamped now. It's so lush now that, now that Activision is not there. It's the same game. A few new areas, stuff like that. So though it succeeded in Destiny, doesn't mean you can do that again. And if Destiny couldn't do it again, there's no way Anthem can do it. Especially when you were kind of burned already. This is already the second shot. People were burned by Mass Effect. And now they're telling me they're burned again by Anthem. I mean... It makes me feel bad for Bioware. For, yeah, for Bioware. And it sucks because, I mean... Dragon Age, where does that leave Dragon Age? Because they did confirm they were doing a Dragon Age 100%, game. Yeah. So where does that leave that? Are people going to be skeptical? Are gonna are, are they going to do the wait and see and hurt the sales of Dragon Age off the rip? I just hope it goes better. I just don't, like you said, I don't want this excuse. Well, we can fix it later. Not necessarily, because as we're probably going to see with Anthem, it's not going to fix, and no one's going to want to play your game. It's just, I don't know what about Bioware, the RPG team, told them that a persistent third person shooter was something that they would be equipped to make and of course they're an incredibly talented team but they're an incredibly talented team that showed a specific skill set and a certain avenue mm -hmm. and they just weren't making games like this before so 
yeah, surprise, surprise, it didn't work out. Not to mention these kind of persistently online looter shooter type games. Only so many can exist at once. We're seeing games like this flop left and right, and we keep hyper-focusing on the successes, but you can make a laundry list of all the ones who have come out and failed from major developers like EA to way smaller teams who have tried it too. So I, I just, I don't really get what EA is doing. They have enough manpower on their end to find teams better equipped to do something like this. And again, this is no shot at Bioware. But again, people do what they do and to expect them to take on something of this magnitude and when it flops, just keep doubling, doubling and tripling down on it when you're basically ripping manpower away from something that could actually work. Bioware focused on like actually being able to focus on a Mass Effect title. Now that's that's returns right there. Mm -hmm. But I just don't see any scenario where you hyper focus and pour millions and millions of dollars into this team where that will ever fix Anthem. I just, it's pretty much a financial sinkhole at this point. They'd be better off just abandoning it. And I get sticking to it to try to make more bang for buck for the people who have invested in it. But at this point, what, it's a year and a half removed? Like, yeah, who's still, I mean, a month after it released, if you try to join a lobby, like, you get like one other player and have to wait for the queue to, to time out so you could just play with that one person. Nobody was playing this. Like, every once in a while I look at this, you know, the, the traction online where you can see who's playing, and sometimes it's like 15 people in your it's region, dead. and that's terrible. That's terrible. And it sucks because, again, we love Bioware. We want everyone to succeed. We want everyone to make good games and to, you know, follow their creative desire. Mm -hmm. And this seems like it was made without love, without... A, if it was made forcedly like they were forced to make it just, just to cash in basically pretty much trying to kill destiny or kill these mmos division all these other games that came people out people saw through it yeah fortunately uh best of luck to everyone at bioware and we hope we hear better news soon uh so next on the list a small update from remedy and they did a lot of uh financial report discussion so really recapping it all i don't want to read a million quotes because you know they're really just talking to their investors, of course, and future potential buyers. Pretty much talking about how they have on March 26th, this first DLC starts rolling out for Control, and you haven't had a chance to play Control yet, right? No, I haven't yet. So they heard they, great things. Though. Yeah, so they have a three main chapters coming, and apparently it's all going to build up to an Alan Wake kind of connection. And there's a lot of stuff that connects to Alan Wake in Control. If you've played them, there's like a lot of Easter eggs and a lot of things with the items of power. So that's great that Control is finally getting still DLC. I do think it's a little late. Um, I don't know what's taking so long and how in-depth the DLC is because it's three separate chapters. And, like, the last chapter has, like, it looks like the Alan Wake cover. So it's all building to that. Maybe they rearranged it. Who knows? But hopefully it does control to that. Besides that, they also are known for their second project, which is the Crossfire X story mode right is that yeah i believe so. Is the way they phrase it, it's single player it's the single player component to the cry of uh, the crossfire x which is gonna be an xbox exclusive should be should be from my understanding yeah. it's gonna be a microsoft exclusive so they have that works on top of that they also have i believe it's two unannounced projects that are they're saying pre pre-production which is super early based stuff you gotta assume it's their next big game their next I'll say the, their next Control, because they are talking about how they want Control to be a franchise, and it's kind of the beginning of a franchise, where everyone kind of thought Alan Wake was going to do that, and Alan Wake never got a sequel. They did do the uh, Xbox One exclusive... Quantum Break? Quantum Break, which was... That's what I was thinking, possibly. ...mild receive. Go, maybe go back to Quantum Break, because that, that universe is also open, and it's also a possibility that they connect all these worlds. That's what I was thinking, if they just Avengers Endgame it and just put them all into one shared universe yeah. that'd be kind of interesting that'd be i would love that because then and i could see it too they're yeah, not that far departures from each other tonally not, to... not tonally again alan wake has that more thriller aspect which fits a whole lot with again it, it just it works so much in control quantum break is a little bit more realistic but again with the weird time mechanics and maybe they want to do split universes or whatever it is go more dc route with different earths that would work out well i hope they do do a connection game and on that, their other project that's, you know, kind of shrouded in mystery, uh, they did, I don't think they even gave it a project name, it's just... They're working on something, they got two things. They have two yeah. main things, so they have the DLC for Control, and then the Crossfire X single player campaign. Yeah, that's what we know of, but... And two other games, which you gotta assume one is their next big game, and who knows what they're working on besides that. Remedy's in a 
hush hush state you don't hear anything until like they're almost ready to go pretty much yeah they 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 have pretty fast turnarounds in terms of when they announce things and when they actually drop stuff. Uh, yeah, my mind immediately went to possibly Quantum Break. I know they have their relationship with Xbox, so we'll see if that pans out and that remains some kind of... Because you know Xbox is thirsty for exclusives, so a major first-party exclusive as a Quantum Break sequel without the TV integration because nobody mm-hmm. cared about the TV yeah. integration. Yeah. You remember that, the show? Yeah, so when I went, when I finally went, got a chance to play Quantum Break, all the episodes were available and you could pre-download it. I was like, I'll download them, no problem. It was so many gigs that I had to leave my Xbox on overnight just to download them because I didn't want to run into an issue where you had to stream it and I had like bad Wi-Fi at the time, so the episodes were a thing. The episodes are boring. Yeah. I, I fell asleep twice because they're sometimes just talking like, it looks like they're going to build up to a sex scene and then nothing happens. It's like, why is this here? <laughs> yeah, I watched one episode and I was like, yeah, not for me. I, I don't know. It was. It is what it is. It's an awkward experiment, but they, they always mess with that live I just feel action. like there's something there. There's there's something there. It was received well enough. I think mm-hmm. it does benefit from the fact that, again, there wasn't so many Xbox exclusives at that point. And, I mean, they're still bu- bumping into that issue, but especially then. So you kind of get that hyper-focus on yourself. So they probably saw decent returns. It's on Game Pass now, so... Yeah, you, you know. gotta assume, and you have to. I know it kind of tongue in cheek leaked that the control contr- coming controls to? coming to Xbox. I that was Phil Spencer, I believe. Who was it? Phil Spencer. They, or they said something. And someone said something, and it's like, well, if someone we're gonna know what game comes to Xbox Game Pass. It was that person. And the, the the rumor at the time was maybe that was actually misinformation that they put there to actually hide the Xbox Series X announcement. So it remains to be seen whether that was just something they put in there for the. The lols, or if that actually is something, I everything else is on there. Alan Wake's on there. Yeah, the Alan Wake's on there. Quantum, Quantum Break's, Break's on there. there. So control. It's just a matter of time. I think as soon as the sales slow down a little bit, and after the DLC, they're gonna might as well. Whenever DLCs come, they either they, drop the price yeah. or something like what they just did with Division Two, which I've been playing and I love that game so far. And so I wouldn't be surprised if they just pop it on Game Pass. There's nothing to be lost yeah. there at that point. Yeah, at that point, like if someone was gonna buy Control, you already bought it. Yeah. So. That would make sense to, like you said, the division. I mean, you got it for what three bucks? Three bucks for three dollars. Quick heads up for you guys. I don't know when you're watching this, but go check it right now. Division two is cheap as hell right now. Three dollars everywhere until March third, which coincides with this. I think the update might be out already, or the New York expansion. New York expansion, but until March third, the division two is three dollars. And it's really good. Go buy. I bought. I have it on PC and I bought it on PlayStation. It's really good because why not for three bucks? And it's yeah, really good. Yeah, really enjoying it. So there's a little. PSA. So again, you have Remedy just working, which is good because people were kind of worried that it was maybe suffering because Control sold, you know, very softly, and they have this backdoor connection to Microsoft. So I'm glad they're working. Well. I'm glad they're doing well. Everyone's getting paid. I don't. I hope this, you know, doesn't look like they're gonna close anytime soon. If anything, they'll probably end up being bought out by probably. Microsoft. It seems that's like the big. That's what I was expecting. You know, I thought Control with Control, everyone thought. PlayStation and you know Sony because was they were all up in their in their headquarters and they, everyone thought this was oh they were posting they there were all about, the time yeah, they were posting there and they were gonna buy you know Remedy after Control I think it's more likely they just keep working with Microsoft and their main games they'll put everywhere so everything's looking well for Remedy which is good all right so the next story is kind of a segue into a bigger subject but Jeff Keighley is skipping E3 mm-hmm. so this is a big deal for y'all who don't, don't know who he is. He has the big major attachment these days to the Game Awards, pretty much. That's what everybody seems to know him for. Yeah. So he released a full statement. I'll link that below in the comment section. Uh, he said a ton of factors went into his decision to back out. I just don't really feel comfortable participating, given what I know about the show as of today. In another tweet, he said that his decision to back away wasn't related to money and that, obviously, they didn't get that far into the process. So, basically, the major subject at this point is the state of E3 right now and kind of how that plays in with the ESA. There's a lot of heat on them lately with their their leaks and the cluster F of what Mm -hmm. their corporation has turned into. Uh, E3 is growing on a commercial end in terms of the amount of people showing, but obviously the presence of the major players is starting to dwindle. Microsoft obviously is still there taking advantage of the Sony. They're out. Nintendo does their own thing, not to mention Microsoft does their show across the street. So they're technically not at E3. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think about the current state of EA or E3? E3 is, and not to recycle the things I've heard so many like bigger people talk about, is a relic from an old time. 
E3 used to be, you know, the gaming journalists used to go there, you know. IGN was there, IGN Japan and Europe or whatever, Kotaku, all these game sets that, you know, don't even exist anymore. It used to be for them to get there, play the games, write up review, not reviews, but, you know, review what they saw and write previews. They started letting, you know, YouTubers in, influers, you know, influencers in, and it started changing more to almost like, like a convention yeah, and like show, a yeah. fan show. And they really doubled down when they opened, I think. It was, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, which was the first time it was just open to the public. And I saw videos because I wanted to Exploded go. Exploded in people. I, I was going to buy a ticket and immediately Sony's like, oh, we were not, we're not going to be there this year. So that's fine with me. Now I don't have to go. Um, and I saw the lines and it was insane. People were waiting like four hours to play like Crash Team Racing and, and all these weird things. It's just a relic of a time. You have, the E3 exists from when there was only very few major con, you know, conventions and show floors. But now you have you know, all the packs. There's GDC, now the North, South, Tokyo Game GDC, yeah. Gamescon, Tokyo Game Show, like you said. You also have Microsoft that just does their XO19. Nintendo does directs. They used to do them very often. It's been a while now. I don't know where Nintendo is. They've been like super quiet for months. PlayStation got their own. Too. PlayStation has their PlayStation experience. They also just hold the conference when they want to. They also have their state of play. True. So why, why do you need E3? And I I get what it is. Is I understand that it's transforming into this where anybody can go get their hands on. You're looking for trouble when you do that. You're looking for population control you're looking for security you're looking for people not going to these conventions some of the biggest youtuber you know game youtubers and sometimes websites don't go to these shows anymore they prefer a private showing they prefer a quieter showing where you can get interviews done right now anyone can show up there it's just huge lines no one's there i mean i mean i know like ubisoft still goes micro like you said microsoft goes nintendo shoots a direct Square, around that Square time, still does Square, a show. Square goes there, but these are all companies that could go elsewhere. If E3 wasn't around, I mean, Microsoft and Sony would be all over themselves. Yeah, yeah, come show your stuff at, come show the new Assassin's Creed at our show. Come show your Watch Dogs and all these gods, gods and what's that? Gods and monsters. Gods and monsters come to PlayStation Experience and show that for the first time. It's just a relic of the past. And then with Jeff Keighley leaving. I think really just states because Jeff Keighley is a big name. People really know him for, yeah, Game Awards. I think he's also, and not I'm not like this crazy Jeff Keighley fan. Like, I, I like the Game Awards. I watch them every year. Uh, this year's, they were, eh, yeah. or last year's. But he is, in a sense, bigger than E3. At this point. Yeah. At this point, like, he could announce, a, oh, we're going to have a show, whatever you call him, Jeff Keighley 2020, next month. And people would want to go to that, and people who are, you know, he's really active on, on you know, Instagram and Twitter, because people know him, they know what, the respect he has. He does get a little heavy-handed, like he was with this Kojima thing for years. Oh, yeah, that's true. Like, like that's his were, buddy. Yeah, like they were blood brothers. I mean, he put him in the game. Come on. <laughs> it is what it is. But he's a personality, and we have a face, and we have what he likes. Where E3 is just... Here's a dumping ground for whatever you want. And it's a faceless corporation, pretty much. So it is interesting to when people want to leave it and be like, oh, E3's suffering. Well, it's, they're not controlling their message. And also they have to realize in this day and age, th th there used to be kind of like a middleman. And we don't really need a middleman anymore. Yeah, no, it's true. It, again, as you said, a relic of the bygone era. I think ultimately you kind of get a trade-off. It's like... You can have it one way where it's more developer and journalist focused and you'll have less tickets sold, but maybe the impact is greater. Or you can make the trade off, which is obviously what they're pushing towards now, which is flood it, inundate it with people, allow anybody who wants to go. You'll get more ticket sale, more revenue generated. But the problem is, as you do that, less big names will be willing to show up because there are just security realities of that. You're not going to see major developers and major YouTubers and influencers walking around when there's just fans flooding them, you know, 200 at a time. Mm -hmm. It's just realities that you're going to just see that kind of morph and change shape. Now, I would like to go to E3 one day, just kind of almost just because of the cachet it has mm -hmm. and what it was at one point. I'd love to say like, yeah, I went to E3 one year. It was a mess. And then never <laughs> go again. I'd like to go once in my yeah. life because I feel like at some point, 
it's either going to be so unrecognizable that it's not considered the same thing, or it's probably going to cease existence at some point. When when Nintendo eventually is like, all right, we don't feel like putting any more money into these booths, and Microsoft's like, oh, we're going to do our own thing in the full capacity. We don't even want to be on the streams anymore. And and when EA doesn't want to be there anymore, and just slowly everybody starts their own little Nintendo Playhouse type little situations, yeah, I would I could see E3 going away and in part just kind of morphing into these smaller packs like shows. Because again, putting all this money, what I would imagine would be a couple million at the very least, to do what ultimately to have a little stage show that ultimately is gonna be crapped on because it's gonna be awkward and weird, and you have these just dance people like I just. I don't really see the the point of it in this, especially going into this next console cycle. Just it seems almost kind of like a weird throwback at this point. But again, I'd like to see. I'd, I'd like to go to it. And uh, yeah, Jeff Jeff Keeley leaving is kind of just it, it's just a symptom of a bigger illness that's been happening for mm. a while now. And we'll see how it plays out. Uh, we don't know the specific reason as to why he's not going. It could be politics. With the issuing with uh, the lobbying body of the ESA, it could be him just seeing kind of the writing on the wall and him not really wanting to put forth the time and effort into it. So it can mean a couple of different things, and maybe we'll never know. But at this point, a guy like Jeff Keighley, he what does he really stand to gain by dedicating an entire week of his life to introduce the most hectic situation possible? Like, I just don't understand. Yeah, I mean, that's a long... I think, you know, he, he would run his little booth, little segment there for like the whole thing and that's gotta be tiring when, especially when you have so many behind the door you gotta assume he's he's going to these first party studios whether it be on you know on all sides you know do you really would you rather have a sit down dinner with neil Druckmann or you want to go host e3 yeah exactly and you know get the same information he has his own show like honestly also, like... yeah he has his own show and also just for the developer wise it's probably such a headache to have to stop production in your game get a group of people and be like well let's get a fragment of the game that doesn't spoil too much but people can play for who knows how long. I just just get me my game and all that showing off your game to less and less people because less and less big names are showing up. So at this point, you're making a vertical slice for the regular consumer base. Which I mean, let's keep it real. They're gonna buy your game anyways. The people are gonna buy your game. Are gonna buy your game. And if they're gonna be convinced, it's not gonna be from E3. It's gonna be from IGN trailers. To be honest, exactly. IGN trailers or just direct. Twitch streamers. I mean, how many times do we just get random trailers just released? sometimes you know i know nintendo's more, more known for that but sony sometimes does that too where it's just like here's an announcement ta-da we don't need to wait for the summer i mean summertime everyone's it's just a busy time it's hot people are irritated yeah. i'm irritated all the time the last thing i would want to do is have to like stay so consistent but like you said i would love to go but not for the reasons i would have back then and if if sony ever goes back to e3 which i highly doubt that would be the year for sure i would go because why not? And the, the reality is if, if you're at E3, you're not seeing all of E3. That's the thing is you can't watch the streams from E3. So if you're actually yeah. there, you kind of have to just choose your battles, choose who you're actually going to see. In our case, we we'll probably go to Sony's show. I'll catch Nintendo after on a video stream so you don't actually have to be there. So, yeah. yeah it's just, a, yeah, it's, that's true. Like, oh, I want to play this game, this game, this game. I will probably get to play like one, one. of those after waiting six hours standing in line with for a five minute demo for a five minute demo with who knows what people standing in lines handing stuff out because i've seen i saw last year's you have just tons of people in line like trying to interact with you even if you're there for a reporting for your youtube channel or whatever it is you got all this other nonsense and it's like how can you keep yourself organized and it's it's nuts so one one day it'll be fun to be like do you remember e3 and who knows, maybe we'll, we'll talk reverse and be like, well, maybe E3 revives as something who else. Knows? Maybe the PS5 era ushers in a new era, but I seriously doubt oh, it. Oh, highly doubt it. I don't want it, but it is what it is. So next on the list, Epic Games are everyone's favorite little company. Epic Games on pretty much their political stance in games. And they, the founder and CEO, Tim Sweeney, pretty much uh, says he argued that a company or business should be operating as a neutral venue for entertainment and employees, customers, everybody else can hold their own views and not be judged by us for that. So on and so forth. Pretty much saying games don't really need a political view. And I don't think he understands what he's saying. I think he's I think he's trying to play to everybody. You know, the left, the right, whatever, the non-whatever they want to call themselves. I don't think he doesn't understand what he's talking about. You're talking about never letting a game like Bioshock come out. 
uh, games like Division. Spec Ops The Line. Spec Ops The Line. I mean, like, some of the best games, like, all three Bioshocks and the future Bioshock games, like, you want no politics. I, I think he's trying to say pretty much, like, not to... I don't know. If, I don't know if he's even saying if it's not to force it. But you're talking about dampering someone's creative aspect and someone's story they want to tell. I mean, even The Last of Us, to a small extent, has some political views of the old world. And especially, it looks like The Last of Us 2 is going to have a lot of that hierarchy kind of power. I, I, I know they're not trying to say, oh, don't make your game pro-Trump or pro-this or non-Trump or against this stuff. But the politics really depend on it. Even in, like, I just played the... Um, not the last of us um days gone not day well days gone too but um why why can't i think of this game just played it the two brothers life is strange too oh life is wow strange. i don't know why that, that butchered me there life is strange too has a big political thought behind it and there is some stuff that is clearly referencing current day stuff and that stuff was impactful to see you know two hispanic brothers dealing with issues when they're you know not to spoil things but how certain people will react to two Hispanic brothers when they find them walking alone or they find them with stuff that maybe they shouldn't and they find them in different places. I think politics and government and that all kind of control, you know, fits in games. I don't know why would you try to say that doesn't belong in your video games. Yeah, and again, the issue, I don't think... Rational people are not complaining about politics in video games. I think mm-hmm. people, some there's a contingent of people who complain when the politics they don't per- personally hold are in the video games. But I think it's more lazy writing is what people have an issue with when you kind of just hand fist these messages into these games in a real lazy way. But again, nobody was complaining about Bioshock's commentary on libertarianism. Like these, th- when it's cleverly done and expertly done and done with care, th- there's no issue with it. And I think, yeah, he's just kind of trying to play the middle ground and neutral and. The life is inherently political, and there's no way you're just going to take out politics from things to be less divisive. I mean, wait, unless you're making Pong, you're, <laughs> you're, you're going to bump into something when you have some types of people when you want to, re- especially when you're reflecting some kind of real world. The moment you have these open worlds that reflect some kind of the modern landscape, landscape you're going to take on what the real world is, which is inherently political, so... I, I see what he's trying to do, and he's probably trying to calm shareholders. You know what CEOs do. They got to massage their contacts mm-hmm. and let people know, like, oh, yeah, we're not going to be those guys that make everybody pissed off. But, again, it's, I think he's more referring to super divisive modern commentary on modern politics rather than just scrubbing politics from games in its entirety because that's not really possible. Yeah, you got to think, like, why? Just also, why would you strike, like start to try to pigeonhole people? Also, but they also have to go to the other aspect and not force it. The, when a game doesn't have any political views or whatever. Then you bump into the Far Cry 5 situation. Far, Far Cry 5. The lack just, of commentary. The lack of commentary. That game wasn't about, like, pro-Trump. You know, everyone assumed it was like, oh, it's pro-Trump because it was around that time. Oh, you're going to kill rednecks. You're gonna oh, kill, yeah. yeah, you're going to kill the, you know. And let me t- that game is way more of a, re- like, that's more a stance against, like, religious cults. Which in inherently could be political to some which people. Which is political to some people, because religion and, you know, that all go hand in hand. But that, that game is more of a statement on, like, religious cults, like, than it is, you know, on that family you have and to... Radical you know, on, on, on radical ideology. radical yeah. ideology. Yeah, didn't have anything to do really with race. Not that I remember, and I spent a lot of time. Even some of the DLC was, like, nonsense, but I never felt like it was trying to make me pro anything. It was just a video game, which took place where it did, and... Yeah, so it looked, people saw it, thought it looked very, you know, Make America Great Again version, and I'm like, it's not, it's not, don't make it that when it's not that, but also, if they did want to make a game which was all about that, go ahead. I mean, it's lose-lose, though. Honestly, somebody's going to pe- be pissed off one direction or another. You do politics, somebody's going to be pissed off because they don't hold those beliefs. You don't do politics, the game journalists in San Francisco are going to get pissed off because you're playing the middle and playing it safe. The reality is, game developers and writers should be able to tell the stories they want to tell However that looks, whatever what characters, whatever races, whatever sexual orientation or religion or political, anything they want to do, let them tell the stories they want to tell. If you don't like it, don't play it. It's simple as that. It's not that difficult. There's enough information on the internet nowadays where you won't bump in blindly into these games. So if you see something that kind of holds views that you don't really mess with, don't buy it. There's so many games that come out on a yearly basis. There's hundreds of games, dozens a week. 
avoid the games you don't like if it really bothers you that much. But ultimately, I don't think censorship is ever a good idea, to be honest. Yes, but you can vote with your wallet. Why, why not? All right, so we got a new PS5 update. You know, we try to do these weekly, keep you guys up. Don't look at us like we're biased. Xbox just ain't saying nothing right now, and Nintendo's yeah. not launching a new console. So yeah, they're really at quiet. least that we know. Mm-hmm. Of. So uh, scarce components have pushed the manufacturing cost for Sony Corp's uh, next PlayStation to around four hundred fifty dollars per unit, forcing a decision, a, a difficult price setting decision in its battle with Microsoft Core, uh, according to people with knowledge of the matter. Now I've seen a lot of misreporting and misunderstanding of this story. So this is four hundred fifty dollars on manufacturing costs alone. So people who are like, oh, confirmed PlayStation Five, four hundred fifty dollars. No, that's not what they're saying. It's saying. The raw parts themselves, just to make the machine, is four hundred fifty dollars. Because I think they opted for a more expensive, a like cooling system. Cooling it seems system like to do. Seems, yeah. not to mention this is being produced in China, and we've talked about this. The coronavirus could play uh, a role in terms of labor costs. That's going to impact labor costs for sure. And not to mention this does not include marketing and packaging and all that. This is just manufacturing of the machines itself. Now, console manufacturers tend to operate on a law structure with exception for Nintendo. So I think this doesn't necessarily count out the possibility that it has a $500 uh, release you know, price. But I think at the very bare minimum is that they cannot release this below 450 or they're going to be taking serious losses. It doesn't look like they're going to be taking any profit margins either, but they cannot release this below $450. So what do you think? So I did a little digging because I don't know much about where this. I understood that like manufacturing costs four hundred fifty dollars, and I was like, well, I don't know what else that means for future bases. But I, I thought to myself, well, maybe max the system is five hundred fifty, and then I looked into it a little bit, and there's some leaked information. At the same time, the PlayStation Four, at the same, if you went back in time when they were doing the manufacturing, was three hundred and seventy five dollars, and that system sold for four hundred. So it's super possible. So even though it costs four hundred fifty dollars per unit, and I know times, economics, dollar values, all different now, I could still see this sell for five hundred. If that gap between PlayStation Four and PlayStation, and, you know, PlayStation Four's manufacturing cost and its release were that close, because they sold at four hundred day one. I understand the parts are more expensive than the PlayStation Five. I understand the hardware, like you said, the cooling system. Apparently, they went with is like super expensive so it'd probably be more on the expensive side i do i i don't like that they keep saying that they're waiting on microsoft to announce that i'm sure behind the scenes they have heard you have people in connections you have your research markets you have people who work on both you know hand in hand part value just parts are expensive you also remember they're not the only people buying these parts you know apple's out there buying these Similar parts. Samsung's out there buying these similar parts. Who knows what Google's doing? They're probably Who fine. knows what Google's doing? Microsoft might be using... Like, sometimes if you open most of these systems, they always sometimes have the same stuff. My only real thought is not to the... The consoles are going to be expensive compared to what we're used to. I would be blown away if the system came out for $600. I understand that's what everyone's worst fear is. Also, because that number has... You know, people have PTSD with that. For the PlayStation 3, they just launched at that. I think Sony knows that as well. I know different people are in charge. I think people just have to worry less. Like you said, people were like, oh, $450 for a PlayStation 4, uh, PlayStation 5, sorry. They're not going to sell it for the exact amount. They're going to try to make something on it. I know they always say they sell it at a loss. And I know, man, in fact, you know, shipping, you know, the, they got to design the box that the box comes in, all those stupid little manuals, buying HDMI, all that kind of stuff is its own thing. I think, unfortunately, we still have to do this wait and see. Just, I think people need to relax a little bit. Though Microsoft's not saying the same thing, their consoles have to be costing about the same. Pretty much. So, And it's important to remember, console manufacturers operate on a loss, but not in terms of manufacturing costs. Mm-hmm. They operate on a loss when you counter you, you count the advertising expense and the production prop pipeline and distribution at that point. That's where they operate on the line. Because... Let's say the PS4, you'll have that three hundred and seventy-five dollar cost of the machine itself. They sell at four hundred, but once you 
they have the shipped and sold model. So you'll uh, it costs what it costs to make the machine, but then there's all the additional costs of the packaging and what it actually takes it to get it out to retailers. You know, all the, the gas expense and the flight yeah. expense and all of those extra costs. It's actually way more. Mm-hmm. So that's where the loss comes in. So it's important for people to know that oh, it, they could sell it below four hundred fifty dollars because console manufacturers operate on a loss. It's like they operate on a loss when you counter you you count everything that all the expenses, but they don't operate on a loss in terms of the manufacturing cost because then they'd be out of business real quick. Yeah. Because not to mention Sony is not in the strongest place right now, and their bread and butter right now is PlayStation, unlike Microsoft. So there's no way they let PlayStation operate on let alone razor thin margins, but mm-hmm. in the red that consistently. And I know they make their money up a lot through software sales. But yeah, if they want any kind of financial viability and existence in the future, they have to at least, at the very least, hit 500. At the very least, to maintain existence in this sphere. Now they have to remain competitive with Microsoft. And Microsoft's probably going to have a multiple SKU type thing. They might have a high-end Series X at a 600 possibly. And then a cheaper buy-in yeah. at like a 400 for example for people who don't care as much for the high-end spec so maybe playstation has to look into that perhaps a lower end skew i th- i think i mean maybe they have you know again xbox is not talking numbers what did their all digital xbox one sell more than it should have you know maybe you know it's it's sold i was at i was still at GameStop and, and people were coming in i want the only digital and i have to ask them three times no discs go inside this system like no no all digital all right and if people were selling i don't know again worldwide nationwide what did it sell i don't know maybe that's something you know it's a good idea it's just my only cut problem the blu-ray stuff out my only problem with is the price point of the, the xbox sad yeah yeah it, it why it was well the msrp is below but it's like realistically you go on amazon you see these machines like what did it retail at 250 i think it 200 re- i think it was like 250 50. That should have been, been 150. That should have been 150. At this point, if that was released at launch, I understand the different price point. Maybe knock 50 bucks off. Yeah, if you got the original Xbox and then an all digital one, it makes sense because then yeah, it would be lower. But you have to look at the economic reality. And when that you was, go on Amazon, I think that was last. That was 2019. Yeah, it was like a year ago. 20 maybe late 2018 that that came. It was out. like a year ago. It was like 200, 250. When you go on Amazon and you find brand new ones with a disc drive for fifty dollars cheaper, it makes zero sense. Sometimes with packing games, I mean, they were selling Xbox One X's with Division and Anthem and (laughs) and Fallout seventy six. Not the best games, but you were getting these systems for three hundred bucks. An Xbox One X for three hundred bucks is a super good deal. Amazing, yeah. Also, just I think, like you said, maybe that's something they have to see. Maybe get cheaper models if you're gonna make this. If you're gonna make the PlayStation Five, like if it has to be bumped up to that more expensive, Castlevania, please, <laughs> that more expensive model, you sweeten the deal. I don't know with what. I understand putting more stuff in the box makes it more expensive, but put something in the box that you can take a hit on. Second Dual Shock. Um, I'm not even sure what else. Maybe a different camera. You ain't getting no second Dual Shock if they if the rumors are true and they put a screen on that. We're back into the Wii U situation now. No, yeah, Expensive that, controllers, you can't buy a new that's one. That's a whole nother situation. Uh, if you're going to do that, sweeten the deal s- with something. True. With some, I don't know, throw a, a six months PlayStation Plus, I don't know, give game vouchers. You got to do something to sweeten the deal where you can kind of bite your tongue on and just look good. Because it'd be, it'd be easier to sell it. Oh, it's a little bit more expensive, but comes with online for six months. Three. Most of them come with a one month thing, but... Three months, six yeah, months. Yeah, my Xbox came with like yeah, uh, or, Game Pass. Or give me a two free game voucher for something or two free ports or I don't know. You got to sweeten the deal somehow if you're going to... Once you hit to that 550 and above, Oof. that's dangerous. It's hard sell. And that's a hard sell. Especially if your competitor comes out with... If, if the Xbox comes out to like 500 and the PlayStation's 550, then you have the reverse of last generation where Xbox was 500 that's it. You had to get stuck with that big old connect. And momentum from the rip is more important than a lot of people like to talk about. Yeah. How like look? I mean, look at Xbox. They launched. They botched it real bad, and then they fixed pretty much every major issue they had, and they're mm-hmm. still having trouble getting traction and making up for the lost ground because this PlayStation got so far ahead of them. Yeah. So you just don't want to screw up your launch because it's hard to make up that lost ground. Yeah, I mean, they were talking about look what Sony had to do. They had to drop their console to what like. It was like 150 
towards the end of the cycle to really beat Xbox for, oh, 360. For PlayStation 3? Yeah, for PS3. They had to tank the price. I got my PlayStation 3, so that launched in 2006. I didn't get one until I think 2011, 2010. I got it for 300 bucks new at BJ's. And that was then. Imagine by the time 2012. Oh, because they it took them a while to edge out 360. 360 was ahead for a while, and then they yeah. finally caught up by just tanking the price. So that that's what happens when you you botch the the, the launch. So you don't exactly. you don't want to end up in that situation. And I I think if there's one thing we could commend Sony for is they they seem to be learning from their mistakes when it comes to like cross play and name changes are a whole another thing for another day. Don't get me started on that, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll see. And then finally, our loose topic. Our loose topic of the week. We have Dead Series We Want Resurrected, which is something we've kind of talked about before, like off camera. Yeah. Um, but I thought it'd be fun to kind of really get back into it officially. So my first one is Golden Sun mm. from Nintendo. I know Nintendo still has the IP because there's a bunch of Smash stuff. In Smash, there's a bunch of Golden Sun. This is such a good RPG, and it's really the game that got me into RPGs way before Final Fantasy VII and all those. Golden Sun is because of Golden Sun, I went and played Final Fantasy VI, which is already c- commenced. Even though they're nothing alike, but just that style. There's only three games in the franchise, and there's you know the first two are stuck on Game Boy Advance, and the other one's stuck on DS. I don't. It might have been 3DS. I think it's DS though. I think it's DS. I think it's regular DS. And this is just, it's such a just good RPG, simple RPG, and with, you know, the, with the djinns, the way they summon them, it's just so, I don't know, I just don't know why they don't bring this back. They have these good IPs, they keep giving you tons of Marios and Zeldas with small tweaks, except Breath of the Wild. Golden Sun could live, and I, I just wish he exist. you know, I wish this franchise would come back, even if they called it something else. I understand, like, the main characters are old in the third one that came out. I just think that they're sleeping. Nintendo's sleeping on this like straight RPG franchise that could be for them. Yeah, amazing. And that's not the only one they're sleeping on. That goes in with the Advance Wars and all the yeah, different stuff course. that they yeah. refuse to tap back into. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I would I would love to see that come back. Yeah. All right, the first one I have is Beautiful Joe. Now, this is a highly regarded series. A lot yeah. of people talk about how great it is, and we see. It's effects on the industry through games like a wonderful 101, but it's been a very long time since we've seen one. For y'all who don't know, there was a direct sequel on GameCube, so there was Beautiful Joe 2, and then there was two spin-offs, one on DS, one on PSP. So the last time we've seen one, I think is about 05, 06, the last time we've seen a brand new Beautiful Joe game. It's been a while. Yeah, and, Double, uh, Double Trouble, I think was, I think that's the DS one, Double Trouble. Yes, and that was after, right after the PSP one, the Red Hot Rumble. Uh, Red Hot Rumble, which is also on GameCube, Yes, for those who want to know. Um, great! All of, I love this series so much. I'm, it's crazy that I didn't put it on my list because it completely spaced out. Beautiful Joe is just such a standout, and I believe with Capcom on this like res, you know resurrection where they're just bringing these good games back and doing good collections, you gotta assume Imagine someone. Imagine a high def Beautiful Joe. Oh man, just give me an HD collection with True. all of them. Don't don't get cheap and give me one and give me one and two. Just don't put, DMC us on Switch. Don't, don't do yeah, that. Don't do that. <laughs> one at a time. But please, I just want those games. They're so good. I. They're kind of side-scrolling platform action games. It's hard to even... But the style, the whole movie aesthetic... It plays so it just plays, clean. Yeah, you know, even though I believe, I believe they rate them E10 and T because they violence and stuff. I believe so. Yeah, um, it's right I'm there. not sure what it is. Let me see. Yeah, We're going to take a quick peek at yeah, the guys. Yeah, grab that. It is. Teen. T for teen. So, yeah, yeah, because as a young kid, like, the, the very adult... Theme and style because even you know sylvia when she gets her spoiler like when she gets her powers she's sexy sylvia like that kind of the style and flavor is something so good i love it so much I, i'm I, surprised I, they haven't I just, tapped back into it it's highly regarded people talk about i mean it he was even pulled out of the last marvel versus capcom true I, I mean that game was also hot garbage but every once in a while though like he'll resurface a little bit and they'll like have like an outfit or something like that and that's like yeah, a DLC. The, yeah in street fighter 5 there's a dlc for rashid which is just him that's where yeah that's... With, but man i don't get me wrong when i play as him it's something that's my go-to outfit but just give me a give me another game if you're not gonna give me another game at least the do remaster. a collection remaster and i will buy it 100 percent. Oh, can't wait um you just got me thinking about Beautiful Joe now, man. I love that game. Uh, my next one on my list, I have a few, but I'm you know sticking to our three here. Also going to Nintendo because, I don't know, they sleep on a bunch of IPs like, oh, like always. And I know they keep saying this game has no place. 
they're nuts if they think F Zero doesn't have a space right now. True. I'm not saying a whole, and I know Nintendo's pr- protective about about their IPs. I'm not saying a whole sixty dollar game, because especially when you you know when the Switch launched, they had fast RMX. Yes. Which kind of which kind it is, harkens to that a little bit of wipeout a little bit. Why of, okay, just why was that F Zero? Just make know. a nice. It can be a budget game. I know they don't want to budget their IPs, but you're also not doing anything with the IP, so making a little less on it or making zero on it. I just like the style of fast-paced racing. The characters are interesting. You know, we've had some good ones. I think the last real, real one was the GameCube game one. Yes, I believe so. Which had, like, a weird story mode, but that was also kind of incorporating the anime or the Fox Box TV show that was at the time. I just want this franchise. I think that was Fox Box before they renamed it, whatever. Four Kids? Four Kids TV. Yeah, I remember <laughs> yeah, that. With Sonic X. Um, yeah, I don't know why they're not releasing this. I mean, you guys put that garbage F Zero game on Wii U. Also, they keep remaking the exact same. Um, not F Zero game, sorry, Star Fox game. Yeah. Star Fox. They, they, there's only two Star. Really, three Star Fox games. Besides that, they just keep remaking Star Fox, which Star Fox 64 is a remake, and then they did Star Fox 64 3DS, which is the same remake of the game, and then they did Star Fox Zero, which was a remake, again, of the exact same storyline. So you're telling me you can crank the same game out, different mechanics. That's Star Fox. I don't know if you ever played it on Wii U. I've dabbled. I tried to forget. Bad. It's a bad game. Yeah. A horrible game. The fact that you have this team doing this game over and over again, and you can't give me F Zero with like tons of tracks. I know they have Mario Kart, which is really their go-to racer game. Just give me a little bit more edgy racing. It's just he's in Smash too, so like people, there's name recognition. People remember him. I, I don't know what their aversion is to dropping a new F Zero title, or yeah. at least he's. I mean, he's a big main. Even if, if you go like the competitive scene, people love Captain Falcon. So if you had an F Zero game with Captain Falcon on the cover, you know how many kids are gonna come in and know him? Oh. Falcon Punch, Falcon yeah. Knee, and all that stuff, and want to buy that game. You're just, I mean, you're you're sitting on money. I don't know what they're waiting. Holds for. up really well too. Those get oh, those are like one of the few like really old shooters. Going back to the Super Nintendo that play, like, impeccably. Yeah, I just don't know what they're doing. Just, I mean, Mario Kart came out near launch. You could get another racer out now. F-Zero. Sure. What you're waiting for. For sure. So, my next dead franchise is something that I hold near and dear to my heart growing up. Mm-hmm. It's Midnight Club. Oof. The last one we saw, I think it has to be the port of the 08 game, which is LA, which mm-hmm. was on PS3. And they re-released it in 09 with all the DLC bundled into it. So the last brand new one we saw was back in 2008, Rockstar. Great, great racer game. But th- what makes it unique is kind of like what Tony Hawk did for the rock scene and skating. This did for hip-hop and racing and mm-hmm. the integration of like dubstep and, and weird trance music yeah. and just R&B and hip hop into the racing scene and all these crazy over the top mods to your cars and the spinning rims and the random rap songs blasting as you're driving through Tokyo like it, it's a really unique take on a race game that they don't seem remotely interested in touching again and growing up like I recently rebought it on PS2 just to play it again yeah. to see what I thought and it's like it's amazing still to this day I don't know that's all, yeah you're right and I I just don't understand why it's been... Every time I've seen any racing game announced, except Forza, because that's its own thing. When I saw Project... Was it Project Cars? Project... Cars, yeah. Cars. Ubisoft's The Crew. Yeah, Project Cars, you know, VR. All these... Anytime I see these all open world car games, and most of the Need for Speeds that have been pretty bad, I'm just like, man, I want another Midnight Club. Like you said, the style, that kind of underground feel... That came out because before it was really there was nothing like that. I know Need for Speed was also a racing game and it had the customization, but there was something about playing Midnight Club that made you feel like you were playing those early Fast and Furious movies. For sure, you know, for not you know forgetting Five and On, just it felt good. Like you got to customize the car the way you want. I remember when I first put like neon lights under my car and I was like, blew my mind. And then of course I'd go watch a racing movie. I just don't know. I know. They're in a different realm with GTA and these big, massive online games and Red Dead. If you're telling me you can sell that, you're telling me you can't sell a card game? I mean, if anyone can do it marketing-wise, off name recognition, Midnight Club would sell. I guarantee you, Dollars to Donuts, that game would sell. And it just seems like maybe the industry has kind of moved in a different direction. It seems like these days they only really want to touch the kind of sim racers at this point. It's basically... If you're not Forza and you're not Gran Turismo, there's not really space for you. 
anymore. And you mm. see Need for Speed trying, trying to get some traction. Like, oh, we could we could do it too. But other than that, nobody really seems interested in competing. And maybe that's just because Forza and Gran Turismo have so perfected racing. But I just feel like if you get out of that sim racing feel and, and really emphasize that style, especially if it's integrated with a lot of like, hip hop is as big as it's ever been yeah, in the world course, right now. So if you kind of tap into that, and there's, we've seen a couple of games do that, like Def Jam Vendetta. Like, that music integration yeah. is what differentiates it. And I think they can do that. Now, it's going to be a nightmare with licensing, for sure. But we've seen, if Guitar Hero can do it, they can do it. Yeah. I think it, it, it can get some footing. Just, you got to market to the kids, get what people are interested in now, get a little Travis Scott in there. I don't know. Figure it out, Nikki. I don't know. Cardi B. Do something. Yeah, I mean, they have the money. So, it's not a... It's not down to like, oh, we can't afford it because oh, they, got the money. they have the money. Coming off Red Dead, come on. Coming off Red Dead, GTA still racking in money. One of the most profitable micro- games, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like a fever dream. I, I don't know. Maybe one day we'll see it. Well, it's just, you know, it'll I just it'll open up. We'll see a nice car driving coming through a nice dark town. And I know there's like some it. racing features in like Grand Theft Auto. But the customization is not really there, not to that extent. Also, the, the a lot driving, of cosmetic stuff. It's a lot but... of cosmetics, but like the detailed details of a game now for a racing game, I just I just think there is a space for between Forza and Gran Turismo. There is more for like you said that down to earth city rolling game. Gran that dark Tur- underground, yeah, that look dark underground drag look, racing. You know, Gran Turismo, good sim, fine. Forza has. Forza Motorsport, which is fine as Sims. doesn't have to be a sim racer. I don't want it to be a sim racer at Midnight Club. And then you have, you know, the Forza Horizon, which is a little bit more objective-based, but that's more just street racing. And it's got that, like, European yeah, feel Yeah, it's always, to like, it, Australia, but... Europe, and it's always these open lands with farms. No, man, I want, like... Deep, dark city. Yeah, man. I just, I can remember, you know, good rain coming down. You had a good hip-hop track playing. Your car was glowing, racing up got and down. Got some weird drum and bass Of course. Song. <laughs> Singing songs, my parents would smack me if they were oh, singing. But 100%. man, that just brings it back. And I just think if anyone were to pull off a good one, it would be them. Like, why? Why they? Why is Rockstar just like not? They got enough teams. I swear, like it wouldn't you take do. them that long. You don't need like yeah, Club you don't 4. need the hugest do it. people. Do it for me. I think they probably would just call it Midnight Club reboot. Oh, that'd be cool. Just reboot. Yeah, because you don't want the sequel number. Because then people are like, I didn't play one through three. I can't play this one. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you Midnight need the car Club. lore. You want all those characters. Bro. Come on. But just put a Tesla in there. <laughs> I don't know. Elon Make Musk the... in the game. I want him in the game. Playable racer. I Elon want him, Musk. I want him, yeah, I want him main to, character. Final boss. Elon Musk. Just race him. I love it. Love it. All right. So for my last mention, uh, it's a game I used to play a lot. Mainly the sequel, Jet Set Radio. Mm. When we're talking about good soundtracks and style, I can't skate to save my life. But man, did I want to learn to skate because of this game. The creativity of each character that they made. I know you and you. You know Sega. I believe Sega still owns this IP because they come out in all like the Sega tennis games and you know Beats always in there. I just I just think this this is such a perfect forty dollar thirty dollar game. It doesn't even have to be physical. Like when I see games like Medieval come back and people buy it pretty well, I'm just like, why can't they bring Jet Set Radio back? And I know Sega's in this weird like slump where everything they put out is pretty bad. I just think that gameplay style, of the creating your own you know spray paint. I know tagging is you know illegal and all oh, that yeah. stuff and that kind of culture really went away i but just hey we concrete genie we just got but that, concrete so. genie comes back and you well you paintbrush it but <laughs> yeah, yeah close you know, enough <laughs> it's close enough but and you even do a little skating but it's not the same that style that was very also hip-hop people come in with just ex- it was just so extreme those extreme you know boom boxes and music i've never heard of just playing you had your little hub world and i again i mainly played jet set radio future which was the sequel on xbox it's just so good. It's just so nonsense, nonsensical fun. And there's not really any more, you know, Tony Hawk games are gone. Skate is, you know, MIA. And there's that other skate game coming out. I don't even remember by who. That all look fine. But I just, I want that style. Running from the police is fun. People do that in GTA all the time. I think there's a world where Jet Set Radio lives. And I hope one day we get it. And that's the thing is, I feel like Jet Set Radio doesn't get the credit it deserves for that particular street, neon, hip-hop, skating aesthetic that has been jacked by two major games I can think. And not jacked as in a way they stole it, but highly influenced. And this might be a hot take a lot of people don't talk about. But 100% Sunset Overdrive and Splatoon got their aesthetic from Jet Set Radio. Let's not... 
beat around the bush. That's where it came look, from. Look at the character designs. Of, and it's funny because I, I've never, I don't even think we've ever discussed this, and you and I, everyone used to fight me when I used to tell them that. I'm like, oh, I'm like Splatoon. I'm like, oh, it looks like a kid version of... Of Just Set Radio. Of just <laughs> Radio the, because yeah. everything's super skate park, and everything's and that grinding style. grinding in Sunset Overdrive. And like, Sunset, that, that's it. Put, put Sega... Oh, and they're owned by, they're owned by Sony now. Yeah. I was say put Sega yeah. and them working together, which still could, but... Yeah, that grinding. There's a the space explosion, for just that radio. There's a space for it. Even if you want to make a smaller title, it doesn't have to be the sixty dollar big game. Put it on Switch. Put it on they Switch. They like small games. I just man, I just recently replayed. Oh, it was a couple months ago. The first one because it's on. Shout out to Vita. It's on. Yeah, play- that's why I was just playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's on PlayStation Vita. Shout out to Vita. They have the first Jet Set Radio. And Runs it's good. So good, man. It's just that you got the music blasting. And it's just like this style is vibrant and. Pretty much any kind of music you want to put on there would fit that, like that techno music. Just yeah, I mean Splatoon did it to an extent. Sunset Overdrive it really did it. I just want, I just want it back. I just love, I love, I love those characters. I just want it back. All right, my last one is a weird one. I don't ever hear anyone talk about this franchise because it's been dormant for a really long time. But it's Parasite Eve. Now, wow. for y'all who don't Ooh. know about it. Go back to 1998, you got Parasite Eve, mm-hmm. you get a sequel in 99, and then fast forward all the way to 2010, you get Third Birthday on PSP, which I guess a lot of people don't realize is Parasite Eve 3. Mm-hmm. For some reason, they didn't name it that, they just named it Third Birthday. Phenomenal survival horror game, a lot of action, a lot faster than some of the more plotting, like a Silent Hill or Resident Evil, it's a little bit faster than that. Phenomenal dark aesthetic to it and i think with the resurgence of resident evil with the possibility of games like silent hill and dino crisis coming back in some capacity i think parasite eve is super at home who would do it i don't know but i feel like with this next gen and survival horror being back in the capacity is like this is the time to bring back who who did the originals square i believe square did the originals be- and yeah, I think Square, this was before the Square Enix integration. I think it was just a Square game. Yeah, man. So they had Square doesn't really have a horror game. No. no Why no. wouldn't you? Uh, man, you're gonna make Marvel Avengers and not make. Don't get me started. On Avengers. <laughs> and not make. Parasite. Don't get me worked up, man. I completely like. Put I think uh, man that w- just that game would work so well for sure. Even if you go back and just remake it l- via Resident Evil style. Like, too. You look at like Outlast and like yeah. all these games that are like bringing this aesthetic back like this is the time to do it and it's fast too so like they don't have to overhaul it in the same way that they had to do for like resident evil 2 which is mm-hmm. way slower with the tank controls and stuff like that this yeah. i mean you up res it you get those yeah. nice those nice fog textures going like you're, you're good to go man i want that's a good game and it's unique you know a lot of people, people don't talk about people it people don't talk about phenomenal it phenomenal right. character design you're right and i never even got a chance to play the third birthday because for the longest time no one said it was Parasite. No one you know, knew what either. that game was. Okay, excuse the technical difficulties. <laughs> we went really long and our camera died. Yeah, pretty much so. It's going to be audio only for this Audio video. only. But, but we only got a little bit to go anyways. Yeah, um, Yeah. so pretty much to wrap what I was saying, bring back Parasite Eve. Great horror game. For sure. Good story. Good lore. And I'm surprised it's not a franchise that's being brought back. I think that's, that's it. That's three and three, that's right? That's it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Long show for you guys. <laughs> for all y'all who are still listening, thank you very much for listening to our weekly podcast. We'll be back here next Sunday with more news for you guys and appreciate you guys listening. Yeah, as always, thank you for tuning in. This was Neo Vintage Podcast. Bye.